Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's uh, live presentation from the Green Line project team. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes here. I'm um, just letting you know that we are here and we're really excited to have you with us. So please just hang tight for a few minutes and we'll get started momentarily. All right, well, hello everyone. I'd like to formally kick off today's session. Uh, really warm welcome to you all from wherever you might be watching from. Uh, my name is Dylan Jones and I'll be the session moderator for today. Uh, I've been doing public engagement on Greenline for about the last four years or so. Um, and I've met many of you in your communities, in your community halls, in the places where you work. Um, and this is a little bit of a different session than we've done in the past. Um, and I really wanna welcome you here today. Um, today, we, uh, we have a, a presentation lined up for you to give you an update on the stage one alignment for Greenline LRT project. We're also going to be hosting a moderated question and answer um, so you can ask your questions and have them uh, answered by any of the subject matter experts that we have with us here today. Um, just a few notes before we get started. A uh, quick technology moment. Um, this is really one of the first times, uh, this is the first time this project team has used Microsoft Teams for a live event. And actually one of the first times uh, the City of Calgary has used Microsoft Teams for a public live event like this um, since the outbreak of COVID-19 and all the precaution, precautionary measures that people have had to take to stay safe and, and stay home. Um, today, I humbly ask you for uh, patience as we, uh, as we work through this. Yes, we've tested it. Uh, we've ran through it, we've tried it out, we believe it should work well, um, but there's always a little uh, possibility for uh, things to go a bit wacky uh, when using technology for a public event like this. Um, so thank you in advance for your patience. Um, I've reminded my teammates who will be presenting to close other browser windows or other applications that they don't need to be using. So hopefully the video stream will come into you uh, nice and clear. Um, you'll notice uh, a box, uh, it's either showing already for you or there would be a kind of a comment box with a question mark that is for the q a or question and answer uh, which we'll introduce momentarily and explain to you how it can be used um, you if you're attending today as a, as a, a visitor or an attendee you won't be able to share your microphone or screen um, so you can feel at ease there and all questions will go into that uh, question box Today's presentation is going to include some updates on the updated stage one alignment, including uh, recommended changes in segment two, which is the area from 16th Avenue to the Elbow River. Um, we have subject matter experts here to answer your questions. Uh, the, uh, the subject matter experts and project team will also be responding to some of the, the big themes heard through public engagement. And actually, maybe uh, quickly, I'll just touch on this because this is really following on a, a long history of engagement with, uh, with you all and with the Green Line project team. Um, so we're uh, kind of coming to the end of our recent round of engagement. Um, we, uh, we came out with engagement on this when, when recommended changes had to be made to uh, stage one of the Green Line LRT to make sure that the decision makers, counselors, and project team members had a good understanding of what, how the public and the Green Line communities were feeling about the changes being recommended. We asked you about the opportunities and challenges, and through doing that, uh, we received over 5,000 comments. Um, you'll see we got a, a large amount of comments on our website. 
um, which we ended up keeping open longer once we were directed to not host public events anymore. Um, so we had a large number of visitors and a large number of comments shared online. Uh, the last time we may have seen each other was actually at uh, Crescent Heights open house. We had 316 people attend that open house. It was a big event um, and it was uh, it was really good to see passionate community members there writing down their comments and asking questions they have about how this will affect their community, which are great questions to ask and we appreciated you being there. Uh, we had six pop up events throughout the city to kind of catch other Calgarians who may not uh, have come out to an event otherwise places like grocery stores or train stations. Um, and we also had a storefront set up in Crescent Heights on the Tigerstead block uh, right next door to Sot and Found Coffee. Um, and we had about 115 guests come through there um, over the course of about a month when we were open on Wednesdays. In doing the engagement, uh, we uncovered, uh, you know, how the members of the public are feeling about the recommended changes. And there's not one way to describe the, the feeling of the changes. Oh, my screen just went off there. It should be okay. Uh, just a reminder to my presenters to uh, hang tight until you're asked to share the screen. Um, and no worries though, we'll just keep moving along. Uh, I was just saying that we've we received about 5,000 comments from you. I've read through all of them. They've been shared with the project team. Um, your comments are taken to heart and are part of the decision making in addition to all of the other constraints and decision making factors the project team has to consider in doing this. Um, I'm going to introduce Quinn Eastlick right now just to go over the moderated Q&A. Quinn, I will send you live. Got to remember to unmute myself. Um, hi everyone, as Dylan mentioned, my name's Quinn. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the discussion on the back end of our uh, uh, session here today. Uh, so I just wanted to go over a little bit about the question and answer and how we're going to be managing that over the course of our session. Um, first, I just want to echo Dylan's comment and thank you guys all for attending. Um, so in terms of the questions, we're going to be tracking those as they come in. Uh, we ask that if you do have anything that you want to, any questions you have, that you ask those uh, as the presentations are ongoing. We're going to be compiling those uh, providing to them to our project team so that we can start preparing responses to you. Uh, and just in terms of being able to manage the Q&A session effectively, uh, we will be capping the new questions that we'll be trying to answer once that Q&A session starts. So please ask your questions as they come up during the session. Um, in, in terms of how we'll be answering those questions, we'll be getting to them in the order that they're received. Uh, we will, however, be doing our best to group together similar questions uh, so that uh, we can get through as many questions, as much content as uh, we can within the time we have available to us. Um, in terms of etiquette for uh, questions and comments as you put them in, um, Please ensure that if you are asking a question within the comment window, if you could punctuate it with a question mark, uh, it makes it a little bit easier for us to uh, sort through all of those comments and questions if we are getting quite a bit uh, in at any given time. Uh, also, uh, please refrain from using any vulgar language uh, or making any derogatory comments during the presentation. Uh, those will not be published. Um, similarly, if you are uh, making a comment or asking a question but have either offensive language or de uh, derogatory uh, statement in your username, that similarly will not be published. Um, Aside from that, uh, many of you I think will see um, on your screen uh, sort of two uh, columns. One is of the public discussion and one is your comments. Um, so you'll be able to see everything that you uh, ask of us uh, in the your comments section. We'll do our best to move those over to the published comments as quickly as we can. Um, uh, and aside from that, uh, we just thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience and uh, we hope this is a good event. Thank you, Dylan. You can take it from here. All right, thank you, Quinn. I'm going to introduce Graham Girillo in a moment. He's the Senior Manager of Planning for the Green Line LRT. Um, just before I do that, I'm going to let you know, once again, this presentation will be recorded today and will be posted on our website within the next two days. 
Um, we will also be hosting another event, the same presentation and format as today. That will be taking place tomorrow night, which is, uh, I believe that's Thursday night, um, from 7 o'clock to 8.30. Now, we've advertised these at, as an hour and a half. We're actually going to extend the Q&A portion, the question and answer period, an extra half an hour. So these, this will go up to about two hours in length for the presentation and question and answer. Um, and we're going to do our best to get through as many questions as we can today. With that, I will introduce Graham Gerillo to take it away for his presentation. Um, Graham, uh, you are live. Hi, Dylan. Thank you. And have you made my slide presentation live as well? I have not, but I will in just a moment. Are you ready for it? Excellent. Yes, please. OK, so hello, everyone. Um, nice to virtually meet all the Calgarians online here. Uh, as Dylan introduced, I'm the manager of planning for Green Line and have been working with uh, an extensive team uh, to to develop some of the updated recommendations for uh, Green Line in our downtown area. And today I want to give a highlight of, of some of those those uh, some of those changes. So for today's presentation, there's a lot of items here and I have a lot of information I want to make sure I go over with everyone. So I might speak fast to make sure that I respect everyone's time to ensure we have a good opportunity for dialogue and questions and answer. Uh, but you can get a sense on the, the agenda here that we'll give an overview on the, the vision of Green Line, uh, why Green Line actually in light of you know the current COVID situation and Calgary's economic situation. Uh, then we'll get into details to talk about what the segment two recommendations are that we'll be bringing to City Council on June 1. And many of you that were at the engagement events earlier this, this winter, um, I'll be touching on what we shared in March and then also some of the things that we've been exploring since we last saw you. Uh, I'll finalize with next steps and then we'll turn it over to the team to, to provide some more detailed information after this presentation. So we always start our, our presentations on, on Green Line with our vision. And I think it's always important to start here um, to, to remind everyone of, of why are we talking about this project. And Green Line's vision is this city shaping transit service uh, that improves mobility choices, you know, um, you know, across Calgary from North Central Calgary to Southeast Calgary. Green Line's about improving mobility choices for everyone. It's about connecting people in places. Um, and, you know, that's about connecting both, um, you know, people to our rapid transit network, but also connecting people to where they work, where they live and where they play across the city. And Green Line's about enhancing the quality of life in the city. Um, and so that's about, you know, through through some of those connections I spoke about, um, you know, ensuring that Calgarians have great ways to get around and enjoy the arts and culture and everything that Calgary has to offer. At a glance, Green Line is a 46 kilometer uh, LRT track that connects North uh, Central Calgary uh, all the way up to 160th Avenue in the north, uh, down to Southeast Calgary into the community of Seaton. Uh, over the life of, of the implementation, Green Line will deliver 29 stations and we're projecting that once the full alignment is fully built out, that over 220,000 Calgarians will, will ride the Green Line uh, every day. So, Green Line is really important as I hit to serve the mobility needs of our city. And that's that's ultimately one of the key reasons that we're looking at Green Line. Green Line is part of our, our broader route ahead uh, plan for Calgary, which um, as you can see in the map on your screen, uh, the green alignment is Green Line, but Green Line intersects and connects with all of our other rapid transit networks with the blue LRT line, the red LRT line, and most recently as we've been building out our MAX uh, BRT lines, Green Line will provide strategic connections with the MAX Teal line, uh, with the MAX Purple line in the down Town and the Max Orange Line uh, in the north of the city. Green Line itself will deliver fast, frequent, reliable transit service um, to both the southeast and north, north central communities of Calgary. And both those communities have unique needs uh, from a transportation perspective. Uh, within the southeast area of Calgary, um, this is a really underserved area for transit today. So there's a, a high population of Calgarians that, that will be able to make use of Green Line once a more convenient and accessible transit system is built in their communities. And you might see on this graphic that 
Um, less than 10% of Calgarians in the southeast currently take transit uh, to get to work. And if you look at the rest of the city, you know, this more, the rest of the city actually is much better served. And one of the main reasons for this, and we've shown the graphic here, is, is different bus routes in the southeast. That buses can take a long, circuitous route to go through the communities in order to get to the closest rapid transit line, which is the Red Line LRT. So by providing Green Line um, to serve to serve the communities in the southeast, um, we should be improving uh, the accessibility of rapid transit in those communities. North Central Calgary already has a well-established um, and dense population area and a greater percentage of, of residents take transit to work today. And this graphic here is showing that between 20 to, to almost up to 25 percent of Calgarians currently take transit uh, to uh, today in, into downtown and across the city. And so there's a need uh, for us to improve transit in that area, which we're recommending some shorter term improvements through um, upgrades and improvements to the BRT system. But ultimately, it's time to change the mode in North Central Calgary and, and move from a BRT system to a, a LRT system, which will carry more Calgarians uh, throughout the city. So as we all know, and because of this online engagement, we're living in a really different world in Calgary and in the world today. And in Calgary, we're both faced with the COVID situation and we're also faced with an economic downturn. And so we've been asked a lot of why are we talking about Green Line today in light of the, the current situation? And we're talking about today because we feel the city that Green Line will be an important part of Calgary's economic uh, recovery. Um, stage one of Green Line will create approximately 20,000 jobs uh, for uh, Calgarians. Um, it, and and that those jobs have already been started, to, are already created today, some of them through our Enabling Works construction program where Green Line's been putting Calgarians to work as we get the alignment ready for construction. And these 20,000 jobs are important because um, if you think about it, there's 20,000 jobs that could be spread out along this 20 kilometer alignment. And so wherever there's construction sites, we know that there'll be workers who will, will want to be buying lunch, uh, buying coffee, and perhaps buying groceries on their way home from work and, and basically spending dollars in the community and across the Green Line uh, alignment area. So that's, that's one important reason why we're looking at Green Line today. Also, we feel that moving forward with Green Line today really readies Calgary for tomorrow's recovery. Calgary's economy and our health will improve. Moving ahead with the project today will pay off uh, for Calgary and to help us with our overall recovery. And you know, I use a graphic here to show, and this really looks at like, uh, Calgary Transit ridership over the years. And highlighting in this graphic, in the 1980s, um, you know, we were facing an economic uncertainty in Calgary at that time. But the city as a whole chose to invest in infrastructure projects like LRT, in fact, a new arena in the 1980s, and other infrastructure projects. And we felt that this paid off. And by the time our economy rebounded in the 90s, there was infrastructure in place to support our growing and prosperous city. So moving forward with Green Line today, we feel we're ready Calgary for tomorrow's recovery. And then another key point I want to emphasize is that Green Line's a long-term investment. It's a long-term investment in the growth and development of our city. Uh, we're building Green Line to serve the, the growing transportation needs of our growing city. And this is both for today and for future generations. And so this graphic here even paints a picture of, of where Calgary's population was focused in in the early 1980s. And you get a sense of how our city has grown uh, out to the outskirts uh, over the years and how our population has doubled over time. You know, as a city, we, we envision that our population will continue to grow. That said, you know, over the short term, um, growth might be slow on account of COVID and the current economic situation. But we expect that the city will will bounce back. Uh, we have a resilient city. Uh, we'll bounce back, and and we'll Green Line will be here to help support that growing city in the future. And I guess finally, it's important to note that that Green Line, you know, is also important to be part of Calgary's uh, global competitive advantage. Um, Calgary, like many cities, are attracting residents and economies to come move to their city. And so Green Line, we feel, will attract new businesses and that young, talented workforce that we, we look for in our growing city. So I want to jump into how we're delivering Green Line. 
So Green Line, um, first of all, I guess it's important to, to demonstrate that we're committed to delivering Green Line within our $4.9 billion capital budget. And this is actually why we're here today, is that we've been making some changes to the alignment to ensure that we're comfortable, that we can deliver the project within uh, the budget that we have. Um, green line will be delivered overall in stages, uh, just as how we delivered the red line and blue lines in Calgary. We built those in stages, uh, starting in the, the center of the line or in the core and making our way, uh, you know, north and southbound from from that area. And so we chose this current alignment as our starting point from Shepherd or 126th Avenue in the southeast to 16th Avenue in the north for a few key reasons. Um, this alignment gets us the great and optimum uh, ridership, probably the best ridership we can get in different permutations and opening day. Uh, the project's ready. We've been acquiring land, preparing the land, um, you know, to, to get ready for Green Line. Um, and also this alignment meets some of our key prerequisites that um, when we build a new system, we need to have space to build a maintenance and storage facility for all of the uh, our LRV fleets. Um, this also meets a prerequisite that it provides these strategic connections to the to the BRT system and into the downtown. Um, but also this alignment is important because it allows us to have uh, ease, easy and incremental expansions both to the north and the south of the system to allow the system to grow similar like the blue and red lines had. So we'll be delivering the first stage of Green Line, which is 20 kilometers, and that alignment will be from 16th Avenue in the north to the community of Shepherd in the southeast. Um, and we anticipate that this, this alignment will, will uh, carry 65,000 riders each day, uh, connecting them to 15 stations across the alignment. So why are we updating the stage one alignments? So we're updating the stage one alignment for really three key reasons that that we let city council know last July that the cost estimates for the project were exceeding our capital budget by around 10 percent. So that's by around half a billion dollars. So we needed to make changes to make sure that our design for the project could be delivered within our budget. But we also wanted to manage risk. We wanted to manage construction risk um, because risk costs money. Um, it also could cause delays in the project. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a lower risk project uh, for, for optimum delivery. And also we wanted to make sure that we're delivering the best value to Calgarians and providing the best experience for Calgarians. And one of the, the higher cost items in the project was the tunnel in the downtown area and as well as some of the deeper stations that we we're building. So we, we wanted to find ways to shorten the tunnel, uh, shallow the depth of the stations to reduce our construction risk, but also to improve that overall user experience. Uh, I just realized I've been looking at the wrong slide, so I think I'm on the what is the updated stage one alignment slide. So, so the updated stage one alignment that we're bringing forward for City Council's consideration on June 1 is shown here. It includes uh, the original stage one, which goes from 16th Avenue in the north down to the community of Shepherd in the south, and we split this into two segments. Segment one goes from the community of Shepherd to the Elbow River. Um, and really, we've made, made no changes to that area. And in fact, we're ready for that area to go up for procurement uh, for construction uh, contractors to bid on uh, later this summer. Segment two, which goes from the Apple River to 16th Avenue, we've made, some re we've made some revisions to the alignment and station locations in the area, which I'll walk you through on that with you today. We're also recommending that we implement some improvements to the North Central BRT. And if you remember that earlier graphic where I was showing that 20 to 25% of Calgarians currently are taking the BRT in that area, we wanna make sure that we're improving and enhancing uh, that system uh, to support Calgarians in that part of the city as they wait for the next stages of the Green Line uh, to, to expand into their communities. So zooming in to segment two, and this is where we'll focus our dialogue on really for the rest of today. Uh, what we're showing here is our recommended uh, updated alignment. And this includes a surface running train on Centre Street in the north with a surface station at 16th Avenue. And in the last uh, while, we've now, uh, we've now introduced that we'd like to recommend 9th Avenue station also be included in this alignment. And I'll touch on that shortly. Uh, we're recommending a, a bridge over the Bull River 
and then underground stations in the downtown starting at 2 Avenue Southwest, making our way to 7th Avenue, uh, then over to the Beltline with the route following 11th Avenue Southwest, um, connecting up to the north end of the Victoria Park Transit Facility. And so maybe at a glance, this graphic here might be helpful to help articulate the difference between the areas. And really the main differences are that we've reduced the length of the tunnel by one and a half kilometers. Um, we've introduced a bridge over the Bull River instead of a tunnel under the Bull River, a surface alignment on Center Street instead of an underground alignment. And then in the Beltline area, where we used to have the alignment following this S-shaped curve from 12th Avenue going north to 10th Avenue, we've brought that whole alignment onto one, one route onto 11th Avenue. Um, and that now is, will be all completely underground with two underground stations in the community. As well as I mentioned, um, we're recommending some improvements to the North Central BRT, and these would be to improve both customer service and also transit priority uh, to help address some of the congestion issues on Center Street today. So I'm going to quickly walk through our, our the segment two alignment through four focus areas. And when we go through these focus areas, I'll, I'll highlight some of the information that we shared at our public engagement in March, um, and, and also that was online over the last few weeks. Um, and then I'll touch on some things that are, are new or some changes we've made uh, since we last met with you in person. So first starting with Center Street North, um, what we shared with you in March is that there would be that surface running alignment. We shared some renders to show what the street might look like with a surface running train, including what the 16th Avenue station might look like and what the public realm, so the sidewalk area might look like in areas with both wider and narrower sidewalks. We also shared with you at that time our commitment uh, to implement streetscape improvements along Centre Street as part of that surface alignment. So we're committed to building new sidewalks, providing new pedestrian oriented street lighting to provide a consistent level of light across the, the street at nighttime and providing furniture like benches and bike racks and uh, waste and recycling bins and also planting trees where, where the space and, and opportunities permit. So we shared renders with you um, back in March of what, in this case, what the 16th Avenue station might look like, uh, which is the terminus station of stage one. So this is the area where the trains will turn around uh, from coming from the south and turn around to go back down to the southeast. And we're showing in this graphic what a wide public realm might look like in areas where the sidewalk is wide enough to provide space for uh, trees to be planted in addition to the other amenities that that will be able to provide along the entire corridor. In areas where the, the sidewalk is a bit narrower, there won't be opportunities to plant trees, but there will still be opportunities to bring in some public realm improvements uh, to really reinforce that pedestrian environment that we understand is so important to the business and residential communities in Crescent Heights area. The design of the street still is not complete. We've been sharing ideas of what it might look like, and we'll want to do some work to engage with the business and residential communities in the fall to better define what the character is of the street that, that the communities would like to see in this area. When we last met with you, we shared what we were still exploring. And so we mentioned we're exploring consideration to add a 9th Avenue station. Uh, we're exploring with the LRT operate in the middle of the road or at the curbside. Uh, we were exploring how vehicles could turn left into the community and to access businesses. Um, and we we're also exploring uh, how we can improve the BRT priority along the entire corridor. So what we've recommended through through some evaluation is, is to add the 9th Avenue station into our recommendation to City Council. Um, this station we feel will uh, help unlock development opportunities in the area and understand that it will now create a destination with the community. Uh, as we heard from many citizens that there was concern that without the station, the train would drive through Crescent Heights, but not have a stop in the community itself. And so we're showing you a rendering here of what that station might look like. We also built a recommendation to have the trains operate in the middle of the road versus the curbside. And we feel that operating in the middle of the road strikes a really good balance between the community's desire to have pedestrian, public, pedestrian and public realm improvements and as many opportunities as possible to plant new trees along the street. Uh, the middle running train provides safe movement of pedestrians, vehicles and LRT across the corridor. 
and also maintains good left turn opportunities at signalized intersections, which I'll touch on in a minute, which can provide access and circulation into the businesses in Crescent Heights and also into the community overall. So I've touched on the, the left hand turns. And so as, as part of the recommendation, uh, we're recommending that left turn bays be provided at four different intersections in Crescent Heights, 7th Avenue, 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, and 12th Avenue. Um, 12th Avenue will allow north and southbound left-hand turns, while other avenues will be restricted to certain movements on the street. And these these left-turn bays are really in almost the shadows of where uh, shadows of some of the the uh, surface running stations in the area. One of the other changes that we're recommending to Centre Street is that we really support BRT and express bus priority along the along the entire corridor. And so what we're recommending is that the BRT buses will be able to operate within the LRT guideway in the middle of the road. So the LRT guideway will be concrete with tracks embedded in the concrete, similar to our trains in the downtown area. And that will allow BRT buses to operate in the same alignment with buses, which will help express buses have greater priority to move through this area. Because as we know, sometimes on even on Centre Street today, there's, there's congestion in the traffic and the BRT is delayed for movement. We're recommending that that BRT priority be extended across the Centre Street Bridge as well um, and transition into the downtown area. So we're recommending that we repurpose the, the layout of the bridge so the two middle lanes carry a BRT and express bus priority. Um, and we've also provided a couple new renders which are on our website. Um, and some of the renders were because we heard um, some comments from citizens that we all show pretty renders in the summer, don't show what a street might look like in the winter. And so we wanted to give an, a feeling of what still a great pedestrian realm in a station could look like in the winter. And certainly there's been concerns that we've heard that the LRT might not be able to operate in the winter. Um, this LRT, like our current red and blue lines, will have no issues operating um, in, in snowy situations. Uh, we've also provided new renders to give a sense from a motorist perspective of what the street might look like, what intersections might look like. So if I can move over into the Bow River Crossing, what we shared with you back in March is that um, we're recommending a, a bridge to cross the Bow River. And we were sharing with you at that time different bridge types that we were exploring and some renders um, to help um, Calgarians understand what the bridge might look like. Um, and how might it land in different areas. And so we shared um, with you in March that there's four main bridge types that we're exploring. Um, the Constant Depth Viaduct in the top left, Trestle Bridge on the top right, Tide Arch Bridge in the bottom left, or Cable State Bridge on the lower right hand side. And we don't have a design for the bridge. These are just renders to show what different form types might look like. And the intent of showing these forms was to, was to start to receive feedback and get you thinking about what form types are you interested in? Um, are you looking for something that, that might stand out more, um, like a, a cable stay bridge or something that seems to disappear more below the horizon line, like the constant depth viaduct bridge in the top left? And certainly we've been hearing a lot of, lot of feedback asking um, for a bridge that does start to blend more into the surroundings and not stand out as much, but yet still have some great urban design features with it. Um, we were also, so since we last met with you, sorry, uh, what we what we were still exploring, we've been exploring the, the alignment of the bridge and looking at more how the curves of the bridge might vary. Um, we also were considering the use of a multi-use pathway, and we also heard requests to provide some new renders of what the bridge might look like from Princess Island Park. So as we've been looking at the bridge design, uh, we're actually playing with some different alignment variations. So different shapes of that S of the curve, of that S-shaped curve bridge. Um, and so we're showing you this graphic to give you a sense of different permutations that we're exploring. So that way you understand when you do see a map that shows a single line over the park that the line the line itself might change over time and that's really dependent on how we finalize the design of the the station at two avenue and exactly where that station uh, ends up being built and will also be determined by where we decide to put the piers or the feet down into the park and that will change some of the curve um, we, we are now recommending um, through some evaluation that a multi-use pathway can be supported on the bridge. And we weren't ready to recommend that when we met with you in March um, because we needed to assess um, what the grade of the bridge might be uh, to, to make sure that it could support pedestrians uh, comfortably. 
and also to ensure that there were some good connection points on the north and south areas of the bridge. So we feel that this, and I'm personally excited for the pathway and the bridge, I think that this will provide a great connection between Crescent Heights and the downtown core and provide some great views for Calgarians on, on family bike rides and excellent views of the different events and festivals that, that happen within the park itself. Uh, as I mentioned, citizens were asking us for some additional renders of what the bridge might look like in the park. And you know, so we, we went into the wetland uh, area the, or the east side of the park and built some renders to show, you know, to demonstrate that the bridge is lower. Um, I think it's lower than some, some folks might have first thought. And we, we're also starting to play with even in the renders um, different urban design features like this inverted V um, that's that could be maybe built over the boardwalk in the wetland clad with wood to maybe start bringing in the natural character of the park. So we're, we're playing with different ideas um, again not to design but to demonstrate realms of possibilities. This render that I'm showing you right now is really taken from the center of the park if you're coming off of the Jaipur Bridge um, in the in the, from Eau Claire Market. And, and you can see this bridge here is hidden behind, in this case, you know, uh, winter trees. And if you can imagine maybe what this might look like today with the trees in full bloom, that you'll, a lot of the bridge will be obscured really from the center of the park uh, into the west area of the park itself. Moving to the downtown, I know Dylan's probably looking at his watch, so I'm trying to keep the pace up here. Um, with the downtown area, what we shared with you in March is that we were exploring uh, a, a surface station in the Eau Claire area that straddled two street in the Eau Claire market site, and also a portal uh, that goes from underground to surface just north of Third Avenue. And we certainly received a lot of feedback and concerns from citizens over this alignment um, and were asked to explore opportunities to, to make changes to, to optimize this, to open the roadway up more, to reduce some of the visual impact and, and impact to adjacent residential properties from a surface station. So we've been exploring that since, since we last met with you. And today I'll, I'll share a bit of a preview of, of a design that, that we're, we're now looking to bring forward to City Council. And this design would move the alignment of the LRT uh, underground into the Eau Claire Market redevelopment site. And as many of you probably know, um, that, that Harvard Development has had plans on the books to redevelop Eau Claire Market, to remove the market and build a new development in the future. And so the opportunity is, the timing is perfect for us to explore a way to work with them to, to, to put the alignment into their new building. Um, so that way it keeps the full road network open and actually better integrates it into a development. And actually City Council um, or the Green Line Committee asked us to do this in January to start exploring ideas for this. And they asked us to take inspiration from the, the new central library uh, where we actually had a portal that went from underground up to surface and we, we enveloped and, and encapsulated the, the portal with this amazing library development. So we've been asked to take that as an inspiration for, for our work. So what we're proposing, uh, recommending, is that we, we, we work to integrate an underground station in the Harvard Development site. And maybe I'll just use these, these renders to give you a sense of what this might look like. So on the right of my screen, I'm pointing to where station entrance might be at Riverfront Avenue and two streets southwest. And on a render here, we're showing that we could build a station entrance um, and it could be a standalone opening day that will allow the developer to then build above and around that development and integrate it right into the streetscape. And then over the portal, so these buildings here would be built over the portal area, and as you get closer to the river around Waterfront Mews, the train would emerge from underground and make its way up to the bridge over the river. And so maybe to help visualize this one more way, we're taking inspiration from King Edward Station in Vancouver. And, and this is maybe how we would build our station in Eau Claire, is on opening day, we would have a concrete structure, um, you know, or you know, an, a, a station entrance that stands alone. And then the developer can build above, like the developer built above King Edward Station over time. And that way the development is integrated right into the building. But we don't want to just stop there at Two Avenue Station. We're also working to explore potential opportunities to integrate um, our station entrances into developments at 7th Avenue Southwest um, and also into developments in the Beltline area. 
So shifting to the belt line, and, and I'm almost done, Dylan, I've got just a few more slides here. Uh, within the belt line, what we shared with you in March is that we've, we've, we've shifted the alignment from 10th Avenue and 12th Avenue, so the train now runs entirely along uh, 11th Avenue east-west. Um, and this was a way of us addressing uh, costs um, as well, but also minimizing our requirement to acquire land for, for Green Line. And so just to help give a sense of uh, the, the general station areas are generally around Centre Street South and 4th Street Southeast, and we're working to refine exactly where those stations will be located. And that might be influenced even through dialogue we have with adjacent landowners. Um, if, they, if there's opportunities where we can integrate station entrances in their development, that might start to shift the alignment slowly. We're also working to finalize the radius of the curve. So the shape of the curve going from two streets, which runs north south, to the curve to 11th Avenue, which runs east west. Each east west, and we're playing with, with different curves um, to understand how that could, uh, what it means for um, existing developments and, and also future proposed developments in the area. And we'll be working to refine that over our next stages of planning. Um, final couple of slides here on the North Central BRT. As I was sharing, that in addition to the updates to the downtown segment of Green Line, um, that we're looking to improve the North Central BRT with customer service and transit priority improvements. And so since we last met with you, we've been working on um, some studies to better understand what those improvements might look like. Um, at high level, I'll share a few of them. We're, we're recommending that we we consider uh, transit uh, des dedicated transit lanes on Center Street between McKnight Boulevard and 16th Avenue. Those lanes might be during the peak uh, periods or all time. That's something we'll have to flush out in some future stages of planning and also do some public engagement on. Um, in other areas, we're looking at some kind of some some quick some quick improvements, like providing uh, a queue jump at the intersection of Harvest Hills and 96th Avenue. So basically, providing priority so BRT buses and other buses can can make their way through an intersection ahead of other traffic. Um, and in the downtown area, we need to look at a more thorough review to understand how we can improve bus operations in the downtown core area. So for for next steps on the project. Um, we are going to the Green Line Committee on June 1. Um, we'll be sharing this presentation and these recommendations with, with those councillors at that time. Um, public like yourselves are all invited to come speak at City Council and share your feedback on our recommendations. You can provide written submissions um, on or before our, 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 our by 12 p.m. on May 25th. Um, you can also come speak at the committee session. Um, speaking, I understand, will be online, so by phone, I believe it is. And if you wish to speak, you could email city's, city clerk's office at the email address on the screen here to request a speaking slot. Um, you can request to speak uh, up until the day of, of Green Line Committee, and I understand that they'll be accepting speaking requests while the public uh, input portion of the agenda is still open. Pending Council's uh, approval or decision on the changes that we're recommending, uh, our planning team is prepared to then advance the next stages of planning. And so there's a lot more planning work that we'll, we need to do to get ready to go to, to get to construction of this. Um, and we show on the screen here some of what that might look like from a functional plan uh, over the next few months, which will start to, to finalize the alignment and the curves and the depths and locations of stations. Uh, we'll also start working with uh, adjacent land developers to explore potential integrated stations. We'll be advancing the planning for the Bow River Bridge, uh, streetscape planning for Center Street and Two Street in the downtown, and also undertaking some mobility studies. And the team will touch on some of these as they present later today. So Dylan, on that point, I'm going to stop uh, my part of the, the presentation and, and pass it back to you for the next part of the agenda. Graham, thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate you knowing that I was uh, watching the time. You know me too well. And if any of your work nightmares have to do with me telling you to watch the time, then I'm sorry. Or maybe I'm giving myself too much credit. Um, just a reminder of what something Graham mentioned there. The information for Green Line Committee is posted on engage.calgary.ca slash greenline. Um, so you can find more information there and we'll always post new information uh, there on that website. Again, this presentation will be shared online within the next two days. 
Uh, right now, we're going to move into having some of our subject matter experts uh, respond to some of the big themes they heard through engagement. Uh, we're going to start with mobility, and I'm going to introduce Dave Thatcher to speak to that. Um, Dave will speak for about five minutes, and after that, we're going to have Josh Workman and Carly Silver speak to the river crossing and environmental considerations. Um, and following that, um, we have Andy Payton, who will talk about noise and vibration. At that point, in about 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to open up the Q&A and all the questions that have been coming in, which I've been seeing come in, thank you very much, uh, will be asked of our subject matter experts and they'll begin to answer all those questions you've been asking. Um, so with that, I'm going to send it live to Dave Thatcher. Um, I'm just going to show you Dave real quick so he can say hi and then I'll share his screen live there. Dave, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Dave Thatcher. I'm uh, working closely with Graham on uh, the planning aspects and today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the uh, mobility pieces and the questions that have uh, come up with the recommended plan. All right, thanks Dave. Your screen should now be live. Excellent. Well, momentarily. In. Yeah. Let me know when it's live. You're good. Okay. So I'm just going to run through the different sections of, of segment number two. Um, so the image you see right now is of the, the belt line, and it's, uh, what it's showing you is that the train is going to be fully underground in these areas. So once the train is constructed, there will be no impact to vehicular traffic along 11th Avenue uh, with the train underground. Um, Graham had highlighted what's going to be happening in the Eau Claire area. Uh, this is a bit different than what we had discussed back in March. And so what you'll see now in the recommended plan is that there's no longer any impact to either 2nd Avenue or 2nd Street or 3rd Avenue. All of that is underground and, and the station's integrated in. And this does allow for the potential extension of Riverfront Avenue uh, into the Eau Claire site in the future. And so this means that this, this area will not have any, any impact on the traffic patterns. Then as we make our way up to Center Street, um, there's been a number of questions about what that interaction is going to look like uh, between the LRT and vehicular traffic. So in the northbound direction, as you see on the screen, vehicles will not be required to stop as the trains are moving, but the southbound vehicles will be required to stop uh, for an LRT signal at that location. And so that's very similar to what will be happening further north in the corridor where there's a single lane of traffic in each direction and vehicles will be required to start, stop for the uh, cross traffic that happens. As we make our way further north uh, along Center Street, um, there will be a reduction in the number of lanes, particularly in peak periods where the lane reversal currently exists today. So that reduction will be a single lane of traffic in each direction at all times, as opposed to the three lanes that happen during the peak uh, lane reversal today. So really what that means is Center Street south of 16th Avenue is be going to become much more focused on local access and circulation and less as the commuter route. Um, one of the things you'll see on the plan that's on your screen as well is that there's going to be pedestrian crossings at least every two blocks. In some cases, it's a little bit closer than that, but at least every two blocks, there will be a signalized crossing uh, for pedestrians across the corridor. So. One of the big questions that has come up is really about where is this displaced traffic that's on Center Street today going to go? So one of the things we, we, we did take a closer look at is where does Center Street traffic come from today? And so just some, some points here. This is uh, for the 6 to 9 a.m. Uh, period. This was in the fall last year. Um, a little bit under 15% of the traffic uh, crossing the Center Street bridge, bridge actually comes from the community south of 16th Avenue. Uh, it's interesting, over 25% of the traffic actually comes from communities north of Beddington Trail. Mm -hmm. Over 10% of that traffic comes from Deerfoot Trails or Deerfoot Trail or points east of Deerfoot Trail. And about 10% of the traffic actually comes from communities along Crowchild Trail. Now, some of them are coming straight down center. Some of them are coming from the east-west avenues. Some are using 4th Street. So there's a variety of ways in which those, uh, those vehicles are traveling across the bridge. But this really starts to answer the question about what are some of the alternative routes that the vehicles can move to. And so this is going to be part of that future work that Graham just touched on in the schedule he was showing. There is going to be an overall north network review that's done that really looks at what are some of those improvements on parallel corridors. And those are improvements that we, we also know are going to be, be something that we want to have in place uh, during construction as well. 
uh, recognizing that there will be disruptions to traffic along Centre Street during construction. Um, and so we've done some initial modeling to look in the, the, the ultimate build condition and, and it's over half the peak hour traffic will need to move to parallel routes. And the information I shared on the previous slide was all based on cell phone data. And so really the alternate routes are anywhere from Deerfoot Trail, Edmonton Trail, 10th Street, 14th Street, Crowchild Trail are really all options. And this is what's going to be looked at in, in the overall North Network Review. In addition to that network review, there's also going to be a study of business access, loading, parking, and really looking specifically at Crescent Heights and the traffic and addressing modifications that will be required to neighborhood traffic calming. So that covers off uh, my presentation on the mobility, and I think I'll hand it back to Dylan to introduce our next speaker. Dylan, I think you're muted. Dylan, you're muted. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Workman, and I think Dylan may have just introduced me on mute. So thank you, Dylan, for that. Well, my um, leader, Josh, I muted and I did introduce you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, thanks so much. I'm just gonna get my uh, presentation up on the screen. Let me know when you can see that there, Dylan. Okay, I just saw it come in, so I'll send it live in the next couple seconds here. Sure. You should be good to go. Excellent, thanks, Dylan. So building on some of what Graham talked about with respect to the Bow River crossing, we wanted to just help answer some questions that we've heard from stakeholders uh, in the first round of, of public engagement. And the first question um, speaks to the um, speaks to the tie-in requirements for the Bow River Bridge. And so we know that we want to tie into Center Street to the north and Second Street to the southwest. Uh, so some form of curved crossing of the Bow River and Princess Island is required for us to make that connection. The bridge um, will need to be defined by our limiting LRT design criteria, so the radiuses for the curves that we use on the bridge will have to meet what the LRT vehicles need to travel um, over, over the bridge crossing. Um, but we do know that there is some uh, variation that, that will be possible for us to explore as we get into the design phase. And so as you can see on, on the screen, this will allow us to consider the um, integration with the Harvard site to the south, um, the exact geometry of, of how we tie into Center Street in the north, and the alignment over the, uh, over the Princess Island Park. And this is something that we know is really important to, to Calgarians and uh, we, we understand the um, consideration that will need to be taken to really carefully understand how to make this alignment work from an environmental standpoint and from a user standpoint for, for all of us who like to go down and spend our time on, on Princess Island Park. And this is something that, that we will be further exploring and better understanding to uh, refine and land on that alignment at the next stage of the, the project. We also heard um, in our previous round of um, engagement that there was a desire to better understand what might the bridge look like on Princess Island Park. And, you know, to further emphasize what Graham had uh, shared before, we, we have not undertaken bridge design work. This is really um, imagery that is used to help us collectively understand what a bridge might look like um, on, the, on the island and from different perspectives around the island. Um, so know that we are not presenting a recommendation of what the bridge will look like. Um, that is a process that will go through, um, you know, a much greater level of, of assessment and engagement um, uh, should Council uh, approve the, the recommendations for the, the Stage 1 alignment. 
So the first view here shows um, a perspective from the Chevron learning pathway looking west towards the center of Princess Island Park. And similar to the image that Graham shared previously, it shows indication of how the bridge architecture might be able to be leveraged to show some form of a gateway um, to, to help demonstrate that crossing into the um, Chevron learning pathway and the overall uh, wet, wetland area. The next image shows an example of, of what the bridge might look like as you're walking along the west side of the wetland on the on the Chevron learning pathway and a perspective of you know how the height of the bridge might might feel at that location. Finally, we have a view from the, the center of Princess Island Park looking east towards the bridge. Uh, and this view helps to demonstrate how the bridge will be screened um, by many of the mature trees that already exist at that location to help give, give a sense of uh, you know, what the experience of, of this um, bridge on the island might be for some of the events and programming that tends to occur more so on the west side of the island. So in terms of some of the um, next steps that we'll be uh, undertaking following the, uh, the council decision in June will be to better refine exactly how pedestrians and bicycles will be accommodated on the bridge. Uh, that's something that Graham mentioned we've reviewed and we will be and are recommending that um, people who walk and bike be accommodated on the LRT bridge, um, but there's uh, further assessment to determine exactly how, how that would best look. Um, in addition, the tie-in with the Riverwalk and Eau Claire Promenade is something that, that will be really important to, uh, to consider and make sure it's designed well, because uh, we know this is an important um, asset and an amenity for the city of Calgary, um, but it'll require us to, to consider carefully exactly how that tie-in with, uh, with the Harvard site at, at Eau Claire is going to, to look. Um, and really then we'll be initiating some of the, the more um, uh, detailed aspects of, of the design. So this will include um, undertaking field investigations that are needed to understand the geotechnical conditions, the river conditions, the environmental conditions, and going through the, the detailed assessment and engagement process uh, to prepare a, a recommended um, bridge uh, with, with uh, the associated design and, and architecture for it. And we will be having a, uh, a comprehensive engagement process um, as part of that uh, next step. So um, again, um, this would be an opportunity for members of the public to participate and share what would be important to them with this bridge. And with that, I will conclude my presentation and pass it back over to you, Dylan. Hi, Carly, I muted myself again. Uh, you're live on screen now and uh, you can share your presentation when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carly Silver. I'm a professional biologist that's working as part of the Green Line team here. So I'm just going to give a quick update on some of the Uh, if everyone just sees that the, the live event will continue in a moment, um, just hang tight here. Uh, we're just waiting for Carly's presentation to be shared. Um, so it will be just a moment. Um, let me see here. Is Carly? Carly may have been bumped off. Um, so we'll just wait for her to join on. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to let you guys know that we've peaked out at about 161 attendees today uh, joining in. So thank you to everyone who's been here, uh, about 161 people, which is great. Um, we're going to get to the Q&A in a moment. And maybe while we wait for uh, Carly to get back on here, we'll introduce Andy Payton. Um, Andy's going to speak to you a little bit about noise and vibration. Um, and when Carly's back in here later on, we'll bring her back in. Uh, we do know, I mean, I told you, I also read through a lot of, I read through every comment we received through engagement. And a lot of those were about concern for the environment and environmental impact of a bridge over Prince's Island Park. Um, so we know that's important to you and we'll make sure Carly's presentation is up here as soon as she's back on. Andy, I'm gonna send it over to you now. Um, so you are live and you can share your presentation um, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Dylan. I am sharing my presentation and I'll just get going in two seconds here. 
All right. Do you mind just telling the folks what your role on the project yeah. is? Yes. My my name is my name is Andy Payton. I'm uh, one of the lead um, lead design engineers on the project, and I've been working on Greenline for for a few years now. Um, most of it on the uh, the center center city downtown portion of the project. Um, so my presentation for you today is is trying to address. Um, noise and vibration and um, to talk about some of the, the issues and how we deal with noise and vibration uh, with, a, with a transit project. So um, the, what we first started out, we were looking at um, the, 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 the noise and vibration policies that the city has in place. Um, what we, we know is that uh, the existing transportation noise policy Although it exists, it is is not um, is not applicable to to LRT in in the fact that it really deals with traffic noise, and and um, and so with that it's more of that that constant noise that you you experience um, from from road traffic. With LRT, it's it's more more transient, where the noise um, happens while the train goes by, and then it's then it's um, then it's regular noise background. And then the train goes by, so it has a different um, a, a different way of looking at, at noise. When we look at vibration, um, the city doesn't really have um, guidelines for noise and vibration, but there is a a study that was um, uh, and a, a document created by the city in 2016 that that talks about the um, the 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 human response to vibration. Again, most of their work that work was um, was related to uh, road traffic and not specifically to LRT. So what we we've done is we've looked at other industry guidelines or standards that we could apply to Green Line to make sure that we are um, we are cr creating a, 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 a good experience for for the for for the for Calgarians. So we looked at um, other noise and vibration um, guidelines that are internationally recognized. And the um, the U.S. Federal Transportation Administration Noise and Vibration Impact Assessment Tool is is what we've um, decided to use. And what what this does, um, I guess, what's really important to know is that it's it was specifically created for transit. So it, it all of the things that that um, you know train that transient. Uh, uh, changing noise environment and the and the vibrations associated with 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 um, light rail transit are specifically addressed in this in this tool, and um, and and this tool has been used in other Canadian uh, jurisdictions for similar projects. Um, the, the 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 vehicles themselves are a, a major contributor to noise and vibration, and what uh, what we are doing for Green Line is that we are we are procuring um, special specialized uh, low floor LRT trains, uh, the, the you know state of the art um, modern trains that are 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 built for for the type of uh, situation that we're 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 involved in in, in Green Line. So these um, have to the requirements for procuring those those LRVs have specific noise and vibration constraints built into the specifications for the vehicles. So these uh, they'll have to have um, self-leveling suspension as an example, uh, where where that that suspension suspension system reduces noise and vibration. The, that the 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 undercarriage of the train will be enclosed by uh, by um, body cowling, uh, so that it has that sort of low profile look. But but it's not just for the look, but those um, those body panels. Um, contribute to ma managing the noise of, of the LRT trains. W the the track design itself is a major contributor to um, to noise and vibration. So the geometry of the track and even how the track is fixed um, to to the to the to the ground or to the substrate. So um, things like high performance fasteners with the, that have um, rubber pads um, incorporated into them. That, um, that that manage that noise and vibration. And 
The, the important thing to understand is that it has to be looked at it as a system. So noise and vibration, if you look at a single component, you're not really going to find the answer or the a solution that, that works. You need to look at it at overall as a complete system. You need to look at the track curvature, whether it's on a bridge or a tunnel, what the, what the material of that bridge is what the ground conditions are as far as the geology. Is it rock? Is it gravel? Is it sand? Is it soil? Um, and specific um, track, track considerations. So when you look at all of those things, including the vehicles, and um, you, you, take, you, you review that in the context of the, of the, the, the assessment tool, you can, um, you can measure what what the um, the noise and vibration impacts are likely to be, and you can add mitigating measures. And so you do an iterative process of looking at the design, um, predicting the noise and vibration issues, and putting in 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 in, in mitigation measures to bring it to the threshold um, that's acceptable based on on the, on the guidelines. Um, in in advance of all of that work, um, we collect ambient noise um, measurements. So we go out in the field, we put up noise monitors, and we measure the ambient noise in the, in the location as it is today. And so everything that happens when the LRT comes along is measured against that baseline. With vibration, we, we, we as part of the geotechnical investigation, we, um, we, 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 propagate vibrations in the ground and we put um, sensors around and we we measure actually field measure the um, the vibration propagation characteristics of the soil and that goes into our model and we we undertake that model again as an iterative process so we do it during the preliminary portion of the design so once we have an alignment set and we know what what the alignment is going to be we we do an assessment on on that level we predict where those um, noise and vibration uh, sensitive receptors are going to be, and um, we, we implement mitigation measures. But that it doesn't end there. So as the detailed design happens and is constructed, that, that model is, is recreated with more detail as, as, as um, the design is, is progressed. And finally, during the commissioning process, uh, the proof is running trains and measuring the noise and and vibration and and again that's done uh, during the commissioning of, of the LRT pro um, system. So this is this is an ongoing um, thing that will happen uh, during the the life of the project and leading up to um, revenue service when the when the train is operational. I'll pass it back to Dylan. That's all I have for noise and vibration at this point. Thank you, Andy. Just make sure I'm not muted. All right, I did it right this time. Nailed it. Um, we're going to move on to the question and answer period now. Uh, Carly Silver, uh, her computer crashed as, her, as she was about to present. So we're working on getting her back on. Um, regardless, the information she was going to share will be shared with you in the next little while. If Carly can't get back on to present it, then Josh Workman, who covered the earlier portion of the river crossing, will present that info. Um, we're going to move, move to the question and answer portion now. Um, by the way, we're going to be sharing a survey link after this so you can let us know how this went today, uh, both the technology for you as well as the format. Uh, I realize and appreciate that this was a long presentation up front before the Q&A, um, but hope that the information was valuable to you and we'd love it if you'd shared that feedback with us in the survey link that we'll share. Um, we're going to move to the q and I'm going to introduce Jess Connors and she'll just explain very briefly how she's going to ask the questions that are coming in. I see we've got a lot of questions and I'm not sure we'll be able to answer all of them today due to time, but we're sure going to try. And that's my reminder to our subject matter experts in your answers to give the question the time they deserve, but also make an effort to be succinct and try to strike that balance. So I'm introducing Jess Connors now to explain the Q&A. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so like Dylan said, we did get a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to go through as many as possible. Um, most of the questions we received were about uh, stage one in general, um, so I'm going to start with those questions and then I'll move through the focus areas. Um, so to start, the first question is, 
uh, overall is the green line on schedule to begin construction next year. Dylan, can you unmute me? Am I muted? You are OK. You're you good. can hear me. Yeah. Yes. OK, my computer says I'm, you can't hear me. Sorry, um, <laughs> I'm wasting time. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, that's a good question. Construction is actually underway right now on our Enabling Works program. We have some projects that are underway today, some that will also begin up next summer. Construction for the main contract in segment one uh, is anticipated to begin in 2021. We will be putting our request for proposal out for construction companies to provide designs and bids of segment one uh, in July, and we anticipate that by 2021, they'll be ready to start work. Okay, Jess, next question, please. And I'm gonna leave it on Graham because if they're general questions, they might be coming back to Graham, so. Um, OK, so the next question is, are the ridership forecasts public documents and where can I find them? So we will be sharing uh, updates on our ridership projections for each of the station areas. We're actually doing some uh, extra due diligence right now to re-review our models and assumptions before we go back to City Council on June 1. So the reports in June 1 will contain some of the updated uh, ridership projections. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what is the latest cost projection figure? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is working from home, my friends, so we're all doing our best here, and that's why I had that technology moment at the beginning. A baby might cry, a kid might walk in, or a dog might bark, and, and that's okay. Go ahead, Jess. <laughs> Sorry, I saw the guy coming up and was like, no. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next question is, what is the latest cost projection um, for the project and how many kilometers of the line will we get? So uh, the, our project cost estimates are within our $4.9 billion budget. So through this exercise that we've been working on to make changes to segment two, we've been able to bring our project costs uh, into our capital budget. And for that $4.9 billion, we will be able to deliver the full 20 kilometers of stage one. Uh, okay, uh, we'll do a couple more general questions. Um, why are you using low floor trains? Uh, this seems like poor planning. Are the high floor trains actually a viable option? Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, I, I was just going to play, Dylan, if I can share my screen in a minute here. Yeah, absolutely. But I can't because I my computer is super slow right now. Um, so I so I won't share my screen. Um, but when it, when it comes to low, low floor trains is is really uh, what, what many companies are manufacturing today. Um, high floor, we still have in Calgary and can still order on uh, special order of need be. But low floor allows us to better integrate the LRT system into the urban environment. And so some of those renderings that I was sharing today on Center Street, um, that allows the train to operate where the platforms are at curb height. So they better blend into the streetscape and the public realm in a much different way than our current existing high floor fleet does. Okay, um, and then this will be the last general question. Um, what will be the yearly operating cost of the Green Line uh, when it's built? Will this result in a tax increase? So we anticipate that the annual operating cost for Green Line will be somewhere between 30 and $40 million a year. Um, and, and that will require uh, a new tax uh, increase or changes to how the city is, is prioritizing other budgets. Um, we do, like I said, have a lot of questions that have come in, so there are some other general questions, but uh, if we have time at the end, I'll come back to those. I just want to make sure we kind of get to a good uh, variety of questions. Uh, so the first question that we have about the Center Street focus area is, um, is Center Street going to be closed during construction? If so, what kind of traffic diversion precautions will be made during construction? Would that be Graham or Dave taking that question? I uh, I could take a stab or Dave, do you want to jump in? Sure. Or sorry, I think we had Agnes lined up for this oh, one. Oh, sure. 
Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, Agnes, they haven't seen you yet, so maybe you could just introduce yourself briefly. Hi there, my name is Agnes Zakowski. I'm part of the Green Line consultant, consulting team. I've been working on the Green Line with this team for, for a few years now, focusing on, this, on, the, on the center city. Um, in terms of construction, um, access, closures, and uh, impacts to the community, not only does this apply on Center Street North, but as well in the downtown. Like Dave was mentioning in his mobility presentation, impacts during um, constructions will be will be assessed from a mobility perspective. So really understanding where are people going and how they're getting there, not only when the green line's built, but while while it's getting implemented. All of that is uh, is part of the next phase of the project where we're going to take a closer look at that at exactly how the green line's getting constructed and how those impacts will be mitigated. So stay tuned for that and more details in the next uh, in the next uh, few months and year of study. Thanks, um, the next question for Center Street is uh, please explain how businesses and traffic can be protected in Crescent Heights from construction closures, removal of parking and impacts due to lower traffic volumes and accessibility. I think I'll take that one, Dylan. Okay, one moment, Dave. All right, sending you live now. Okay. So one of the, there we go. One of the key things with uh, the, the proposed plan is that there won't be on-street parking on Center Street. So one of, the, one of the studies that will be conducted is looking at opportunities to create additional parking off of the corridor. So that's one of the ways that the uh, the businesses will be supported um, from that matter. Um, and sorry, could you repeat the rest of the question? Uh, sure. So the question again was explain how businesses and traffic can be protected from construction closures, removal of parking and impacts due to lower traffic volumes and accessibility. This is in Crescent Heights. Yeah. And, and so I, th I think just the construction piece of that question, um, there's going to be different points where there's different impacts along the corridor, but that's obviously going to be part of the 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 uh, contractor that is responsible for construction of working closely with the, the businesses. And um, I don't know, Graham, if you want to speak really briefly to the, um, the the program for supporting businesses as well throughout construction uh, or if there's somebody else that wants to speak to that. So getting a thumbs up from Graham so you can go ahead, Graham. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so, so businesses on Crescent Heights, as all businesses in Calgary, are important to us. We want to make sure that we're finding ways to to support them through the planning, design, and construction of the Green Line program. Um, so, we're building a business support program on Green Line that aims to help businesses prepare for construction and also to help support them throughout the life of a construction program. And so from a preparer perspective um, that might help them understand what our construction plans are um, to help them think about even ways that they might uh, make some changes to how they operate their business. And I don't say this, I say, I'm not saying this is the city suggesting how to change operate your business, but to think about um, some of the opportunities that construction might present. And I know as I've spoken to businesses in other areas where LRT construction has occurred, they actually enjoyed the benefit of having construction workers buying lunches, um, coffees in, in their areas. And so if we can help businesses on Centre Street prepare for those possibilities, that might help them be extra successful during construction. Um, as the to support them during construction, uh, we'll be looking at potential opportunities such as working with the business improvement area to help promote shopping the areas and also building some uh, good wayfinding and traffic management programs to help ensure that Calgarians can easily make their way to their favorite business. Um, a final part of how we, we plan on supporting businesses in Crescent Heights is to do um, a business access, loading and parking study and plan. And that's really to look at how can we make sure through the green line design that businesses are still able to um, receive deliveries, um, have opportunities for parking in the in the area, and, and overall can be successful from a business operations perspective. So we'll be exploring opportunities such as perhaps uh, making changes to um, parking on adjacent avenues to support short term parking for businesses and potentially also opportunities for short term off street parking such as a, a small parking lot in some areas. 
Um, okay, um, so the next question on Center Street is, will there be two lanes for traffic on 16th Ave? In the rendering, it looks like the car is on the same track as the train. So I'll take that one. Yeah. Uh, just for our presenters, uh, if you're unmuted and you're going to take it, it will take a moment for me to get your video over. But if you just want to go ahead and start speaking to the answer, that's okay. Sure. So in terms of, if I understand the question correctly, in terms of 16th Avenue, there's not going to be changes to the numbers of lanes on 16th Avenue. For Center Street, as we're coming up to 16th Avenue, it will be a single lane in each direction and then the left turn lane as well. So that's the configuration that will exist uh, at the intersection of Center and 16th. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, will traffic calming and neighborhood modifications be done uh, within a certain radius of Center Street, um, particularly in the Tuxedo Park and Crescent Heights area? And I'll take that one as well. And so when it comes to the traffic calming, there are some certain things immediately along the Center Street corridor within Crescent Heights that will need to be modified and changed to allow for business access. Um, so those are some of the pieces that will, will happen. It's not a set radius. It's really trying to look at what are the anticipated changes in traffic patterns. And so there's a part of this that's directly tied to what Green Line is going to be responsible for doing. But then there's that broader North Network study that will look at, at the areas north of 16th Avenue as well uh, as part of that. OK, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to move on to some questions about the uh, river crossing and the bridge. Actually, um, Jess, just oh. before you do that, uh, since we're getting to the river crossing portion now, and I know people have a, a large interest in the uh, environmental considerations, uh, maybe we could bring Josh in just to cover Carly's slides since she hasn't been able to get her way back in. Um, we're still going to get to those questions immediately after, but this seems like an opportune time to get Josh in here. Uh, Josh, are you OK with that? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, you're live. Perfect. I'm just going to share the slides. Um, while you're sharing the slides, I'll just make a comment to everybody. Uh, we had a question come in asking if we would share a record of all questions asked, even if we can't get to them all today. And we will <coughs> share a record of the Q&A chat going on there. I uh, will publish that afterwards when we share the video as well. OK, Josh, I will share your screen right now. Excellent. Thanks, Dylan. So as part of the planning process, we've had um, a number of different environmental specialists provide input into the bridge alignment and recommended that the bridge really minimize its, its footprint within the constructed wetland. Um, but the detailed environmental studies will be completed, as I mentioned earlier, when the when the bridge design moves forward and is finalized to ensure that the design and construction plans minimize the impact and natural areas to meet the municipal, um, provincial, and federal regulatory requirements that, that the project will, will um, of course, need to um, uh, follow and abide by. And just to give you a, a, a bit of a sense of what those specific permits, approvals, and, and studies required are, they're extensive at each level of government. So at the municipal level, there's, uh, you know, things like the biophysical impact assessments and tree protection plans, as an example. Uh, at the provincial level, obviously, this crosses a um, large, important body of water. So the, the Water Act applies, Public Lands Act, Environmental Protection Enhancement Act, Historical Resource Act, Alberta Wildlife Act, and at the federal level as well, we're, we're required to follow the Fisheries Act, Unimaginable uh, Waters Act, Species at Risk Act, uh, Migratory Birds Convention Act. Um, so, so all of these pieces will um, be a part of the next steps, but most of them you can't proceed with until you have a design in place. Um, and so that's why um, they, they haven't been initiated at this point. Um, some of the additional considerations that we that we did hear a fair number of, of questions on were, um, you know, related to, to bridge shadowing, graffiti prevention, constructed uh, wetland lagoon impacts, construction disturbance, and, and flood mitigation. And so, um, you know, the shadowing from the bridge will will not be stationary. It'll of course move throughout the day with the movement of the sun. Um, and so, the the shadow is really a, a smaller strip as opposed to a large block, similar to what would be created by a building. Um, 
Um, the, with respect to graffiti prevention, there's a number of different tools that can be used, um, such as intentional art place. You might have seen something similar over in the East Village um, that discourages uh, graffiti. And there's also different material finishes that can be selected that allows for um, easy and simple removal of, of graffiti, um, along with the um, environmental considerations with design, which we call SEPTED. Um, and so that will ensure that there's good sight lines, lighting and comfortable public spaces. Um, with respect to the constructed wetland lagoon, um, this is something that we will uh, seek to mitigate as much as possible through the bridge design and the bridge alignment. Um, and you know, while there is potential for some of the structures and footings uh, for the bridge to be located um, adjacent to the uh, constructed wetland, uh, construction can be strategically timed and we can use methodologies that really reduce the impact to wildlife and vegetation in the area. So there's temporary impacts to vegetation from construction um, that would all be restored to integrate with the surrounding natural area. And that's true for the construction disturbance overall as well. So while we expect there to be temporary disturbances to vegetation and wildlife and uh, temporary impacts to park users, once construction and restoration are complete, the permanent features of the bridge will only be the structures of, of, and the footing themselves, much like you know many of the other bridges across the uh, along the Bow River. Um, and then lastly, the flood mitigation is something that we will be uh, studying carefully uh, in the next phases of the design uh, using the most up-to-date uh, hydrological models to understand how the bridge structure might influence the, the river flow and mitigating um, with, with any additional steps necessary in that regard. And that's all on the, the slides from, from Carly. Josh, thanks for stepping up to cover that while Carly was uh, kicked off the internet. Um, we're going to turn over to Jess now with some questions that have to do with the river crossing. Jess, you're muted. It's not just me. Thank you for being a good friend. Uh, okay, sorry guys. So the first uh, river crossing question is, why are you building a new bridge across the river when there is another one so close? Uh, seems that you could use one bridge for both lines. I think this person is referring to nearby LRT bridges. Yeah, I can I can cover that off there, Dylan. Um, so, so as I had shown in the um, alignment figure, really the goal of our bridge crossing is to connect to Second Street Southwest uh, and North to Center Street. So utilizing the existing Blue Line Bridge um, that's to the east uh, would not fulfill that alignment requirement. Okay, um, so the next question is, these bridge designs and renderings look like they are very simple and utilitarian. Will the team be engaging uh, in a more creative, with more creative architects or designs uh, in order to deliver a lighter, more aesthetically pleasing design that would be more appropriate for a structure that crosses one of the city's premier parks? Absolutely, um, and I, uh, I I try to to emphasize that as best I could when I was introducing the renderings. But um, you know, these are um, kind of indicative of the of the shape and the location of the bridge only. Um, you know. Following the June Council meeting, we would go through a very comprehensive stakeholder engagement process where we seek to understand the types of aesthetics and desires that Calgarians have for the bridge to determine whether it's you know something that's sleek and simple and fits in with the natural surroundings or is more unique and iconic, similar to the Peace Bridge. So those will be uh, the next steps as part of the, the bridge design process. Okay, um, so the next question is, uh, is there a method to remove the overhead electrical wires to power the train and use an at-grade power source on the bridge itself? I'm going to pass this one over to Andy to see if he can answer this for us. All right, Andy, you can go ahead and speak right. if you're ready. Okay. Um, there, there is technology uh, um, that uh, is out there to do that, uh, uh, batteries on trains for, as an example. Um, but it's uh, not proven in, in this environment, um, so cold temperature environment. So what we're currently looking at is the, um, is the overhead catenary system across the bridge. Okay, uh, so that was the last 
bridge crossing question. Uh, so moving on to downtown questions, this will include um, the 2nd Avenue station and the 7th Avenue station. Um, so the first question is, most renderings show the 7th Avenue station going north closer towards 5th Avenue. Would it not be better to have uh, it closer to 8th Avenue where the long-term underground red line will go? I you can... Me to take that? Go ahead, Agnes. Um, um, in terms of the station spacing and and the location of Seventh Avenue Station, we have we have looked at placing the station south of Seventh Avenue. However, what it does it it disrupts the existing LRT system as we would have to construct underneath it. There are other uh, geotechnical and uh, and um, ground condition issues south of 7th Avenue. Uh, some of the buildings protrude tighter into the right of way and we have challenges actually fitting our station into the space between the buildings. Um, in terms of the spacing towards um, um, 2nd Avenue station, the stations are approximately 450, 500 meters apart, which is appropriate for station spacing in a busy downtown core. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, will Eau Claire Market be required to develop um, in a certain time period uh, or will uh, maybe we buy the land back and do something great for the city with the area? Uh, basically, I think this person is asking kind of what the timeline is for the Eau Claire Market uh, redevelopment site. Graham, you're muted, but your screen is live. Sorry, Graham, one sec, you're still muted there, so hang tight. Okay, are you not able to unmute? Okay, um, thanks for bearing with us for a moment here, guys. This is one of those uh, technology moments we're gonna have to work with for a second. Is there somebody else here uh, who might be able to take that question or should we hang tight for a second uh, and go on to another question? Go on to another question. Okay. okay. So we're getting a note from Graham. It seems like he might be writing to us from outer space right now. Uh, <laughs> International Space Agency. <laughs> um, so we're going to go ahead and let him do that. Uh, Graham, uh, we hope you're able to join us back quickly um and uh we'll see you soon okay we're gonna go on to the next question jess uh sure so next question is um have the stations in the inner city uh have the locations of the stations in the inner city been fully determined or are they flexible uh what is the impact to the businesses along the underground line uh and what is that going to look like in terms of city support I can take that one. Go ahead. All right, Andy, please. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the the station locations aren't aren't set. So there's um there's still some variability that we need to work through. Um, much of it will de de be determined by by um, land um, discussions with 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 respect to station entrances and station um, integration with with adjacent developments. So. That that's that's uh, ongoing work that will will be done over the the coming months until we we can pin down those station locations. As far as um, impacts uh, to um, to adjacent um, businesses, there will be impacts as far as um, during construction uh, with uh, with the the size and the scale of the excavation required to construct the the underground stations. Um, however, um, during once once the station is constructed, um, they'll be fully integrated. And um, as far as the the actual underground portion, uh, it it'll be it'll be under the road and um, not not um, not impacting the number of of lanes on on the existing roadways. Uh, before we get to the next question, uh, Agnes, did you want to add anything to that? I know you had your hand going up at the same time. No, all good, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I see Graham back here. Graham, if you wanna test your mic. Does this work now? Oh, wow, that was slick. All right, you're good. We're gonna get you up here for that last question. Uh, maybe Jesse could repeat it. I believe it was about the Eau Claire site. Sure. 
Um, basically, the question is uh, asking about the time frame for requiring the Eau Claire Market site. Um, basically, like people have noticed that this site has been scheduled for redevelopment for a long time. So just trying to figure out uh, what that time frame looks like. Yeah, and I think what that question is referring to is that when um, the Harvard Development purchased the Eau Claire site from the city uh, many years ago, there was a rebuild commitment with that purchase. And so um, they they have been waiting patiently for Green Line uh, to confirm what our allotment plans are in the area um, to, to allow us to find these opportunities to integrate our developments with each other. Um, so I can't speak on behalf of Eau Claire Market and their development plans, um, but certainly um, the uh, the alignment and station design that we are recommending will require the market to be removed. And so I imagine that will help accelerate development times so that lot does not stay vacant. But again, I can't speak directly for what their development plans will be. OK, thanks, Graham. Um, so the next question, we also did have a bit of um, a clarifying question around using the Center Street Bridge for LRT. So I'm going to ask this question um, and kind of combine that. So uh, the question is, can you remind us why the line does not go straight down Center Street into the downtown, but instead jogs over to the sec to Second Street as proposed? Uh, why not use Center Street Bridge? Dave or Graham or one of you could uh, take this one. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll start to jump in uh, and I'm going to share my screen, Dylan, if this works OK. Yeah. I'm there just letting people know while you do that, Graham. We still uh, we were originally going to end around 1.30. Uh, it's 1.30 now. We still have 123 people watching, which is great. We're going to keep on going with the Q&A and uh, take it up to 2 o'clock. So uh, <laughs> thanks everyone for the questions and um, we're going to do our best to get through as many as we can. So I don't know if you can see the screen here. We have a photo of downtown and the Center Street Bridge. Dylan, is that what is seen on the screen? Uh, it's loading right now. So let me uh, okay. see if I can launch it over there. It looks like uh, I don't see an image. I just see a banner that says why build to 16th Avenue North today. OK, well, then I'll go back a slide. There you go. Yeah, that looks good. Excellent. So and I pulled up this graphic to help me visually demonstrate why that when we're building an LRT system, we're trying to, to bring the LRT where the most jobs or populations are. And I called up this image here to demonstrate um, that Center Street Bridge, if the alignment followed purely on Center Street, the green line really would not be getting close into the heart of the downtown. And so our alignment is on two streets, so we're two blocks west of, of the Center Street Bridge and getting closer into really where the major um, uh, commercial and um, in business areas are in the downtown environment. Um, we have looked at Center Street Bridge in the past and with our current um, light rail vehicle design, there wouldn't be room on the bridge for two travel lanes, two sidewalks, and two trains to operate within the with the current design of the LRV that that we've planned for the system. Thank you, Graham. Uh, Jess, you're muted. Uh, do you have another question? Thanks. Yes, I do. Um, so this one is about the uh, uh, BRT improvements that we're proposing. Um, so the question is on page 12 of your May engagement boards, you identify potential North Central BRT improvements. Are these improvements included in your budget and will these be part of the plan council will be asked to approve? So I'll, I'll jump in for that one. So the, the BRT improvements are uh, considered as we're, 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 we're recommending that uh, part of the Green Line budget be used to support them. And the improvements would range anywhere from 50 million to $100 million. Um, this is a conversation we'll need to have with our funding partners to ensure that they're comfortable using the budget to also support the North Central. And that would be a conversation that we would confirm uh, after council makes a recommend, uh, once council makes a decision on our recommendations. Thank you, Graham. Wow, Jess, with the next question. 
Um, yeah, so that was um, most of the questions that we got um, about the different focus areas. So I'm going to loop back to some of those general questions that we got about uh, stage one overall. Just, um, just yeah. a suggestion as we go through those, in case we do have more for the focus areas, maybe we could go like uh, in that same order again and go with three questions, three questions, three questions, or something like that, just to sure. make sure we're doing an even spread around the areas. Yep, I can do that. We did get through most of the focus area questions, but uh, there's a few that are left over. Um, okay, so the first question is, um, if the green line is an investment in our future, isn't it a better idea to build it right the first time and not do the cheaper version above ground? So I'll, I'll address that question. Um, that was part of our exercise that we've just undertaken is, is to determine first what we feel is possible within our budget and, and to to demonstrate first to ourselves as a planning team, do we feel that we are making the right recommendations? And you know, the biggest change I believe that maybe this this person might be referring to is is running the train on the surface of Center Street. And one of the reasons that we are recommending a surface running train on Center Street south of 16th Avenue is because the vision for Green Line uh, moving up the North Central Corridor was always to run the train on surface north of 16th Avenue. And so this is extending that northern vision uh, closer down to the Center Street Bridge. And, and that's why we've been working to develop renders and 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 planning design objectives to to design a system that can be well integrated into the street and work to achieve many of the interests and objectives of the neighborhood. So we're recommending what we feel is a good decision uh, with our current budget and the current time to to build a system to to support that long term uh, vision for Calgarians. Um, next question is, why was this version of stage one selected? Why not 7th Ave to Seton, for example? Um, is it just less cost? So I'll jump in with that and Dave, feel free if you want to add more. Um, we, we've been actually exploring different options of different alignment permutations um, as part of our due diligence leading up to our council presentation on June 1. And we've been undertaking that to, to confirm, have we chosen the right alignment or might there be um, better options for Calgarians? And through our analysis, we've determined that this alignment from the community of Shepherd, so 126th Avenue in the Southeast up to 16th Avenue, uh, provides the greatest uh, investment for Calgarians today this will support the greatest number of, of riders on opening day and allows us to future proof the system for easy lower cost expansions to the north and to the south. If we were to stop Green Line Stage 1 in the downtown core, um, it will be a significant cost in the future to connect 7th Avenue or Eau Claire up to 16th Avenue um, for one or two stops and as opposed to um, completing uh, stage one at 16th Avenue North allows us to start expanding the system the same way that we've expanded the current red line and blue line systems with those one or two station incremental expansions. Um, okay, thanks. Um, what will parking look like at newly built stations? How much capacity is expected? So I think this is referring to any park and rides um, within stage one or um, just like parking additions in the area of our segment two stations as well. Andy, are you able to speak to the overall park and ride design of the system? Yeah, overall, um there are park and rides planned um, at stations in the in the southeast at, at Shepherd, at Douglas Glen, at Quarry Park. Um, there's a, approximately 1900 uh, traffic um, or, or stalls um, planned as part of um, segment uh, segment one. Um, as far as the um, the other stations in the, in the downtown core or the underground stations, um, there are um, no no plans for parking at the station. Okay, uh, so the next question is, 
Um, do we, the public and counselors, see the results of the engagement sessions? Um, there was lots of negativity for the bridge through the park, um, but now it's just being presented as a concern. Uh, wasn't the engagement to listen to citizens and then make a decision? So I think Lara's, is Lara on the line or I could speak to that? Uh, I can speak to that, Graham, if you want. Sure. sure. Go ahead, Dylan. So this is Dylan again here. Um, yeah, the, the engagement comments, every comment we received will be shared in a What We Heard report uh, in the next, uh, prior to June 1st and maybe even in the next few days. Um, all comments on there will be shared. And in there, you're going to see that, yeah, there was a lot of concern about uh, a bridge over the river from the public. It is one of the top themes when you come to the river crossing portion uh, of the line. And so that will all be shared and made public. Uh, at the beginning of engagement, we always try to be clear about what is our purpose of engagement and what we're asking. And with this engagement, as a, a recent round after years of engagement of understanding how people feel about the Green Line and the Green Line community, hopes and aspirations and, and fears and concerns. This round, we said that uh, we were doing engagement to uh, understand the opportunities and challenges associated with the updated stage one. And we're doing that to make sure that the project team and that the decision makers and counselors have a good idea and a good understanding of public sentiment and how people feel about uh, the Green Line as the changes have been recommended. Um, so all of those comments will be shared um, and that should be published on engage.calgary.ca uh, in a slash Green Line, sorry, engage.calgary.ca slash Green Line uh, in the next few days. Uh, while I'm on the mic here, before we go to Jess's next question, um, I'm just going to link in here. We just for the first time have less than 120 attendees watching. So I'm going to post a link to a short survey in the Q&A chat. And if folks would take five minutes once this is all done to answer a few questions, it would really help us understand how today went for you and how we can make some improvements for the next time. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Jess, for the next question. Sure. So the next question is actually about Center Street. Um, it is, do you know how much more traffic will spill onto Edmonton Trail, 10th Street, 14th Street, and Crow Child, and what the impact will be to businesses and residents on those roadways? So I'll take that one. So I, part of that North study is really going to address exactly what the volumes are that go to those other routes. In, in, in real round numbers, we, we know that it, at least 50 percent of probably a bit more than that of the traffic will divert onto other routes uh, and so the exact percentage to each route is what's going to be determined through that other study uh, that will be started over the summer i think i did see a question on the timing of that and that was on graham's last slide um, but that's really what's going to determine exactly how much is going to those routes and then really identifying where there's some key areas where improvements are required uh, in order to deal with that additional traffic load Okay, um, so after the Q&A started, we did actually get a couple additional questions for the Beltline focus area. Um, so I'm gonna ask those questions now. Um, so the first one is for the 11th Avenue tunnel, will the surface traffic and condo parking access be affected? And I could take that one. So with, with respect to 11th Avenue, uh, the train will be fully underground there, so there's not going to be an impact to, to the surface in the ultimate condition once the LRT is constructed. And will there be any, there won't be any parking access issues either? No, it's going to, it'll be all fully underground. Okay, um, and the next question for the Beltline is, um, with the 4th Street Southeast Station near the event center um, and being underground, it's in a flood plain um, and that area was flooded in 2013. Uh, why not elevate it to a plus 15 level? Maybe we could ask Andy or Agnes to speak about the flood uh, design of the system. Sure, I can, I can take that. We'll go, okay, yeah. We're going to let Agnes go okay. this time. Andy called we'll fight David. over it. We'll rest. Pardon me? Go ahead, Agnes. Okay. 
Um, so in terms of the design um, design of our stations, uh, this is a consideration not only in the Beltline, but also in the uh, in Eau Claire as well. Uh, part of the design process is to make sure that our station entrances are um, are above the the projected flood levels, and there and we built in um, we built in that the station a little bit higher into the design and work to integrate it into the adjacent uh, um, adjacent uh, developments. Um, in terms of the portal as well, the portal does come up on the back side of the Victoria Park Transit Centre. The way the portal is going to be designed such that it comes up against um, above those flood elevations as well. So we built in that natural protection through our through our design process. So elevating the system, it's where we're not putting it above grade at a plus 15 level, but we're elevating our, we're raising our station entrances and our portals such that that protection is built in. And maybe if I could just add in Agnes um, that that we're also designing the system uh, with at the one to 200 year flood level with a buffer on top of that height, um, which um, is above and beyond what typically developers might build to in the downtown area. But given the, the long life of the Green Line system, we wanted to make sure that we're being extra diligent in our, our planning and forecasting for uh, potential future events. OK, um, so the next question I have is, um, what would the additional cost of having a tunnel all the way to 16th Avenue be? Uh, wouldn't those costs be offset in the long run as a result of not having to deal with snow removal, traffic incidents, and other costs that come with a street level build? So um, we've had that question a few times of, of what are different ways we could address these changes. Um, and so a one opportunity could be to use a bridge to cross the Bow River and use a cut and cover approach to have a shallow tunnel under Center Street. Um, the cost to do a uh, shallow tunnel, tunnel on Center Street would be anywhere in the range from around 230 to 300 million dollars. Um, we've only done an initial costing on that since that's not part of the design. Um, and we've not advanced that design work um, given um, that cost is outside of our, our budget affordability range. Um, OK. Um. OK, would it not be cheaper to integrate the line into the current LRT system? Um, basically, what are the costs uh, in the long and short term of having these new low floor trains? Sorry, Jess, I got sidetracked. Could you please repeat that okay. question in case it's for me? Um, it is, would it not be cheaper to integrate the line into the current LRT system? Um, what are the costs? of these new uh, low floor trains um, at, uh, in the short term and long term? So that was actually, um, as mentioned earlier, that as part of our due diligence leading up to June 1, um, our, our June 1 recommendation to City Council, we explored different ways that we could um, rethink the alignment. And one of those ways was actually bringing Green Line um, uh, in the Beltline area, connecting it into the tunnel that currently goes uh, under or just north of Stampede Park, crossing over the line and connecting into uh, an LRT tunnel that's been pre-built under City Hall and actually running Green Line up um, Stephen Avenue. And it was, an, it was an idea that I'll be honest was was interesting to a lot of folks and and because it, it could have allowed us to use the same um, maintenance and storage facility uh, with the red and blue lines. But what we found is that technically that solution just didn't work, that, that we cannot find a way to cross green line over both the north and southbound traffic of red line underground without significantly impacting the, the red line uh, traffic. And given how successful Red Line is today, uh, we felt it did not make sense for Green Line to, to for one transit project to be impacting another successful transit project. So we had to uh, put that idea to bed um, and instead we focused on the current recommendation. Okay. Um, 
The next question is, why not have the Green Line move to run along Deerfoot and go to the airport and surrounding communities north and south? So I, 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 I'll touch on, you know, more of the, the center street, but maybe I don't know if someone on the team here was involved in the early day planning along the Nose Creek and could speak to that first. Thanks, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Okay, so th that was part of the uh, the route selection study that was done for uh, North Central, and so that was the previous alignment along uh, Deerfoot Trail. And when that study was completed, that's when the decision was made to uh, bring the alignment onto Center Street. So that was a decision that was made uh, several years ago before the more detailed work was advanced uh, that the team's been going through over the last couple of years. Okay, uh, Graham, did you have anything to add or no? No, I think Dave captured it there. Thank you. Okay, um, so the next question is, um, if the additional studies that we're going to do prove that the assumptions made are not correct, what will the city do when it's too late to go back? Why can't you wait for these studies to get approval? So I, I don't know how to interpret that question, um, so I'll interpret it and answer it in two different ways. If, if the question was around the due diligence studies where we're looking at ridership projections, um, those studies are, are in their final phase of, of documentation. So we're aware of the results and those results have confirmed that the stage one alignment from 16th Avenue North to 160 126th Avenue Southeast is still the, the right investment for Calgary. When it comes to the other studies, such as the um, mobility studies um, in the North area, the intent of those studies really is to understand, as Dave mentioned, where people are going today and which parallel routes they might travel on in the future by motor vehicle. So we can identify and prioritize what kinds of improvements might help best manage uh, the increased capacity on those roadways. Okay, um, and so we have another just kind of general question. Um, so the question is uh, $4.9 billion was the pre-pandemic budget. Uh, governments are now in serious financial trouble as are many taxpayers. Why not a smaller Green Line project that recognizes these realities? And so as I've recommended, shared earlier, um, our recommendation for stage one is to connect North Calgary with South Calgary to allow for that ease of expandability into the future. Um, with respect to the budgets, we've been having conversations with our provincial and federal funding partners, and they've reconfirmed or reiterated their support for the Green Line project. Uh, and so the really that's when we see the benefit of Green Line becoming more of that economic stimulus project, uh, in addition to building infrastructure to, to basically get this Calgary ready for our comeback. Um, okay, and I have uh, another one. Uh, this is about Second Street um, alignment and station. Um, so it asks, where can we see the data for the jobs and density uh, to support the station at Second Street Southwest rather than at First Street Southeast or at Center Street? Uh, so I could start to answer that. Um, we had to see um, where that information is. I don't have it handy, um, but really what we're pulling is information on um, numbers of jobs uh, in areas. And that's when I was showing the image earlier that um, as you can see the tall towers, you know, around two, three Southwest, there's a much greater density of jobs uh, in, that work within that area within a five to 10 minute walking distance. As you move to Center Street or even further over to First Street Southeast, we're really moving out of the, the core of the downtown. Uh, we'll have to get back to find out uh, where that information from the corporation, where it might be available. If I could just add on to that. Um, so on the city's website under the forecasting toolbox, that's where the data about the projections about job and population growth are. And if you click on that, specifically the downtown one, it'll show you what, what the estimates are for downtown. Excellent. Thank you, Dave, for answering that. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm just doing a time check. It's 1.55 and I've promised to end by 2. Uh, Jess, how many do we have time for one more question here? 
Uh, yeah, there's one uh, quick one that's kind of a follow up about the park and rides and parking, um, particularly in segment two. So I could ask that one. Please do. Um, so it's a follow up, like I said. So as there is no park and ride plan for 16th Avenue station, uh, what is the estimated ridership from that station um, after completion of stage one? And would this ridership justify doing this section at this stage? Dave, do you want to start that one? And maybe I'll start. <laughs> yeah, if you want to start it, go ahead. I'll, I'll start for Dave. I, I don't have my the, the, the latest numbers in front of me as we've been updating um, the model projections. What we do know is that the 16th Avenue station will be the third busiest station in stage one. And that's after 7th Avenue downtown and Shepherd in the southeast. Um, there's a couple of reasons why 16th Avenue Station is so busy. Um, first, it, it's a major connection point with um, the city's Orange Line uh, Max BRT. And so you might imagine that um, citizens that live in Quarry Park might take Green Line up to transfer to the Orange Line, Orange Line BRT. Um, to make your way to the hospitals that are east or west of that area or to to be able to take the, the max orange brt to get right to the front door uh, of your building on the university campus um, so we anticipate a lot of transfer points at that intersection at that area um, we also know that there is a high density of population that lives around the 16th avenue station and it's probably one of the highest densities of, of populations along many of our stations um, over the whole calgary transit lrt network i don't know dave if you have more to add into that no i, th I think that covers it off Okay, uh, I'm going to take this moment um, to just make a couple of closing remarks to end today's session. Uh, to the 162 people who joined us online today and to the 94 uh, still watching and attending, sincerely thank you very much. Uh, I hope this presentation was useful to you. Again, we've shared a survey link in the Q&A and if you could take, you know, two minutes or, you know, I said five, but I don't think it will take that long. A couple of minutes to let us know how today went. Did you have any glitches with the technology? How did the ratio of presentation to Q&A go for you? Uh, we'll really look at that um, and, and consider that for our next events uh, as we host them online. We do have another event. It will be the same format as today. The only thing that will be different will be the questions that come from you, the audience. Uh, that takes place tomorrow night starting at 7 p.m. and we'll go all the way up to as late as 9 p.m. Um, I want to remind us of a couple of things. This presentation will be shared online in the next couple of days, as will a record of the Q&A chat that uh, you were all contributing to and witnessing. Um, the What We Heard report for the public engagement that was asked about will be posted shortly on engage.calgary.ca slash greenline. Um, I'm going to show you real quick just uh, the website where you can find a lot of this information. I'm sure many of you have been there before. Um, this is actually, in the, since we relaunched information on the page uh, just last week, we've had about uh, 5,000 unique visitors uh, visit the page. And so this is it right here. Um, this is engage.calgary.ca slash greenline, as you can see up at the top. Um, when you come onto the page here, um, you're going to get all the information you need, including attending the live events, which you're doing today. Um, we also have instructions for successfully joining a live event. And if you scroll down just a little bit more, you can see this section here, which is participating Green Line Committee meeting on June 1st. And so in case you're curious, that information is posted here on the website. Um, and you can also dive into more information about segment one or more information about segment two to get some more information. On Sorry, here, we Dylan, also- I don't think you're actually sharing your screen there. I think it's just uh, you. Oh, really? Okay, sorry, it shows uh, that I'm sharing it. Well, nonetheless, no problem. What I've said still stands. Engage.calgary.ca slash greenline. You can find information about how to join uh, the committee meeting and where to get more information about the Greenline LRT. And we've also got some Q&A and uh, frequently asked questions documents on there as well. Um, uh, I think that's about it for today. Once again, I really want to thank uh, you, the attendees, for joining and for all our subject matter experts for being here. Uh, this is a different type of engagement than we've done in the past, um, so I miss being in the same room as all of you, uh, Greenline communities and Greenline guests, um, and look forward to the next time we can do that. Until then, uh, you and your people stay well, and uh, we will talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.